today, the world-famous Blackpool Promenade Tramway, with its fascinating mix of modern and vintage rolling stock, some well over 60 years old, is flourishing. However, 40 years ago, the system was set for a period of deep uncertainty. Faced by falling passenger numbers and increasing costs, Manager Franklin had recommended reducing the fleet size, closing the three town routes and certain depots. He also admitted that the relatively modern coronations ordered by his predecessor were a financial liability. The events up to the end of 1961, including the closure of Lytham Road, are fully documented in our highly praised tape, Blackpool Trams Part 1. By 1962, with one town route already gone, the other two were now under threat. The spotlight was first turned on the U-shaped Martin Line, which since closure of Lytham Road and the Martin Summer Extension to South Pier had been curtailed at the Royal Oak. The final date of operation for the three-and-a-half-mile route had been set as Sunday the 28th of October. The overall sense of gloom was deepened when headways were reduced in January 1962 from four to five minutes during the day and to every nine minutes during evenings and on Sundays. However, during term times, loading still required the use of double-deckers. 257 reversed at Royal Oak. These specials ran both in the morning and afternoon. The in-town loading point for Martin was Talbot Square. After negotiating a very short length of single track, the cars used one of two sidings, the southern one connecting with the promenade. Departures from both termini were regulated by Bundy time clocks. With the development of high-capacity one-man buses, by 1962 any 48-seater two-man vehicle was an increasing anachronism. Proceeding up Clifton Street, past the Tivoli Cinema and Yates's Wine Lodge. These 90-degree curves into Abingdon Street were the tightest on the system. This busy stop served the market and adjacent shops, as well as the pavilion, opera house and winter gardens. A late attempt to curtail the line at this point to avoid the twists and turns down to Talbot Square was sensibly rejected. The marble dome of the Regent Cinema dominated the skyline as a pair of the town's locally built Burlingham-bodied Leylands shared Church Street with the trams. The Hippodrome Theatre, which in 1962 was undergoing rehabilitation in the background as the ABC Cinema and Theatre, was to play a suitably dramatic role in the final death throes of the Martin route. This elevated view clearly shows some of the changes made to the 1939 Sun Saloons, rebuilt for use on Martin. The Van Back equipment had been housed at the base of the trolley tower and the poles had six-inch wheel trolley heads, unique to the upgraded Martin route. The attractive shelter, complete with clock tower at Devonshire Square, was subsequently demolished. Snaking away onto Whitegate Drive. To help maintain the tight schedules, a skate in the overhead controlled the traffic lights at this busy intersection with Hornby Road, one of several stops serving popular Stanley Park. This stretch of Whitegate Drive, with its shops, schools, trees and elegant residences, has changed little over 40 years, except for dramatic increases in road traffic. This busy stop served the nearby health centre and Elmsley Grammar School for Girls.
the tram pinch sign on the left warned oncoming motorists that the track swung towards the curb near Beechfield Avenue. Approaching the wide forecourt of Martin Depot with the municipal coat of arms over the doors. The stop at Martin Parish Church was just before the extremely busy junction with Preston New Road at Oxford Square. This represented the farthest inland point reached by the trams. Picar's short working showing Oxford reversed here. Note the passenger shelter and clock tower on the left. Sweeping along Waterloo Road on the final mile down to the Royal Oak. with Pioneer Rail Coach 200 pursued by a van back. In the 1961 season, peak demand had been for 13 single-deckers, five on South Shore, seven on Royal Oak and one school special. Reversing near the Waterloo Hotel, none of the line's five partway crossovers were individually wired. Scenes at the junction with Central Drive closed in 1936. This had been the original point of entry into Central Blackpool for Lytham trams. Cresting the bridge over South Station, which today marks the current limit of the railway since closure of Central Station in late 1964. Royal Oak Terminus adjacent to the Palladian Cinema with its trolley reverser installed in the 30s. Walter Luff's vision of a traditional tramway operated by silent, modern, single-deckers working on well-maintained track had really started in 1946, when Railcoach 208 was fitted with the revolutionary VAMBAC or Variable Automatic Multi-Notch Braking and Acceleration Control. The success led to the relaying of the entire route and the fitting of VAMBAC equipment to the 12 1939 cars numbers 10 to 21. Ten years later, the experiment was over, defeated by congestion, increasing costs for power and specialised spare parts, but primarily by the high crew passenger ratio. In 1962, 208 made only occasional appearances. Here it was seen leaving Talbot Square for the 20-minute journey to Royal Oak. As Martin Depot also housed many promenade extras, since the closure of Lytham Road, these had to reverse against the main traffic flow to run into Talbot Square on the single track connection. So during 1962, a parade of different types of car could be seen returning to the depot during the late afternoons. As some of these journeys carried passengers, the surviving standards revived memories of former days when they had worked the route until gradually replaced by the Vambacks, their last regular duties not disappearing until 1954. Also based at Martin were the 12 luxury boats of 1934-5. Having left the prom, the conductor then had to reposition the pole onto the Martin-bound wire at Talbot Square. Having checked his pole is on, the driver accelerated away up Clifton Street for the one and a half mile trip to the depot. At the end of a hectic afternoon, an empty boat sailed past Devonshire Square, the conductor absorbed in his newspaper. A spell of duty on the prom could be quite taxing on the nerves. Here a handful of passengers bask in the evening breeze, enjoying this boat ride along Whitegate Drive. With closure of Martin, all the various seasonal extras would have to be dispersed to other depots. To avoid blocking the main line, 
depot-bound cars swung onto the siding in the depot forecourt, which then gave access to the two halves of the building. The four eastern tracks held the seasonal extras, the illuminated fleet, and various other oddities. The seven remaining standards had all been in use since July. Their appearance normally depended upon the availability of drivers and part-time or student conductors hired for the prime summer months. Also, as a standard required only one conductor, as opposed to the two on a balloon, every effort was made to put them into service. To enter the four eastern tracks, trolleys were changed again, for the third time since stopping on the prom. Martin had its own office, inspectors, staff and cashiers. Here the shedman replaced the bamboo pole after stabling his latest charge. Opened in 1901 and subsequently enlarged, Martin held approximately 50 cars on its eight tracks. Until 1936, it had been operational base for the town routes. During the Second World War, it had been requisitioned for use by the RAF. Rewired and reopened in 1945, it was then closed for the winters of 1954-59. to 59. Although opening during its last three winters, the bulk of its inmates were in hibernation. Amongst them was the mobile TV studio, constructed from former toast racks 165 and 166. Used first by the BBC and then by ABC, they fell into disuse after the 1961 illuminations. Across the dividing air raid shelters were the four running tracks. In mid-1962, these were filled with rail coaches, including Vambach 208 on track 1. With Glasgow having abandoned its trams in the September, many enthusiasts recognised that Martin was now unique. It was the only example of a classic all-street running British tram route. Consequently, several special tours were organised over the final weekend. As a prelude to the main events on the final morning, the new western train embarked on a rare excursion to Fleetwood. By far the largest and most impressive of the illuminated fleet, the locomotive with its tender-mounted trolley was constructed from Railcoach 209 and the trailer from Pantograph 174, their combined seating capacity being 95. Passing Fleetwood Station in the background. Since its first steaming, two features have since disappeared, the illuminated cowcatcher and the ability to emit smoke. On the way out was the oldest illuminated car, the gondola, scheduled for the scrapman following a collision. Built on the truck of a 1901 four-wheel boxcar, this delightful nautical creation had been launched in 1925. It could carry 20 guests, who boarded by clambering over her sides by means of a little ladder. In former times, a small orchestra playing tunes from the gondoliers had added to the magic as she floated majestically along the prom with her high prow and pagoda-style roof. As Martin was to bow out on a Sunday, only five Vambacks were required. However, with a fine sense of occasion, two were replaced by standards late in the evening. Carrying a wreath, and suitably inscribed as Royal Oak's very last tram, 48 made the ten-minute trip to the depot at 11.30. Here it is seen departing from Royal Oak. Three minutes after 48 arrived at the depot, Open Balcony 40 rumbled in on the 11.30 departure from Talbot Square.
last to arrive were the illuminated standards 158 and 159, carrying transport officials and civic dignitaries, including the Mayor, Alderman Richardson, who had spearheaded an unsuccessful campaign by local residents to prevent the closure. Watched by over 300 people, the doors closed behind the last tram just before midnight. Walter Luff's dream had been snuffed out. During its 62 years, the Martin route had carried an estimated 275 million passengers. Now the next generation would be transported on 71-seater Leylands on a new six-minute headway, with the replacing Route 26 being extended at all times to South Pier. The overhead east of the depot was rapidly severed, but amazingly, PCAR trams emerged for duties on the prom the following day. In fact, for the next seven months, the truncated stretch to Talbot Square had something of a charm life. On the prom, things continued much as usual. However, with diminished depot capacity, in the November, the corporation generously offered the Tramway Museum Society its collection of historic trams. Despite being a little overwhelmed, the Society set about preparing to remove this group of priceless vehicles, but not before organising a winter weekend of farewell tours. Few of those participating on the 12th and 13th of January 1963 would have dared to predict that many years later the same trams would be welcomed back to Blackpool to star in various celebrations. On Saturday the 12th, the freezing fog having dispersed, the two number 40 sallied forth into the bitterly cold wind. Virtually skating along the frozen rails, the two veterans, some hardy souls braving the double-deckers open balconies, first travelled out to Bispam. After running round the loop, they again headed south. To sharpen the senses, neither car had heaters, and in 1963 even those on regular service trams tended to be out of order. At the Pleasure Beach, Balcony 40 struggled to cut its way round the frozen loop, which during the winter was largely disused. On the morning of the 13th, the fog had returned. Undeterred and wrapped against the elements, those on board soaked up the atmosphere. To start with, number one of 1885, in company with Boxcar 40 of 1914, ran out to Fleetwood. This proved to be one of the most memorable tours ever held along the Fyle coast. Even the Pharos lighthouse was almost invisible. With its controller on full parallel and icicles hanging from the driver's spectacles, number one galloped back towards Bispam. Someone later observed it had been an unforgettable experience, like rocking about in a rowing boat in an Arctic gale. Starting in March 1963, number one, the star of the 75th anniversary celebrations, would spend some time at the Clapham Museum of British Transport in London before going to the Tramway Museum site in Derbyshire. Eventually, this remarkable little car would return to Blackpool to feature in the 100th anniversary celebrations in 1985. Scenes of the car reenacting conduit-style operation with batteries will be one of the features of our video Blackpool Trams Part 3, expected in late July 1998. The afternoon tour on the 13th also visited North Station. A dramatic close-up of 59 using the trolley reverser installed in March 1961.
Later, rack number two was replaced by Vanback 11, specially extracted from Martin Depot. At the end of the tour, the car was stored in Bispam, prior to travelling south to Havant, for intended use on the former railway branch to Hailing Island, a scheme which never materialised. The other Vanbacks were among 17 cars, including the last pantographs withdrawn in 1961, broken up at Martin in February-March 1963, reducing the former neat interior into a tangled mass of twisted metal. Also lost were the two experimental cars, 208 and 303, the latter being the last tram to make the one-way trip out to Martin. Motors, controllers and doors, etc. were salvaged from the English electric rail coaches to replace the non-standard Crompton Parkinson equipment on the majority of the brush cars. Escaping from the Martin mayhem were the boats transferred to Bispam and the illuminated fleet and promenade extras which went to Blundell Street, reactivated in March 1963 to absorb spare capacity. Not expecting movements on an abandoned route, this motorist had parked perilously close to the connecting curve at Talbot Square. Most of the 23 transfers were undertaken by Shed and Work staff, the majority at the end of February 1963. However, the final trio to be liberated did not depart until March the 11th. The first, discoloured by smoke and dust, being 251, which had been trapped behind mounds of scrap. This was followed by number 48. Last to emerge, suitably shrouded, was the truncated gondola. It was hard to imagine the one-time glittering elegance of the corporation's first illuminated tram, now looking like a floating bathtub. The bizarre procession set off for Talbot Square at 12.16. Trundling behind 251 came the gondola, wheels flashing as it passed. Following these movements, the power would be switched off and the bulk of the wiring dismantled, although, amazingly, the Martin story was still not quite over. Appropriately, the last tram from Royal Oak now became the last ever tram along Whitegate Drive and Church Street. Subsequently, 48 was to leave for an American trolley museum in August 1964. Blackpool could also have had a museum if plans to convert the old tram road permanent way store at Copps Road had been successful. Hoping it would be, the TMS moved several of its new acquisitions to the site on April the 18th, 1963, but when the scheme failed, the building was dewired in the September. In 1998, the 100th anniversary of the tram road, this is the only company building still standing. Never a running depot, the six-track shed always served as a store. Later, between 1929 and 1949, a connecting railway track at the rear had allowed coal wagons to be hauled by the corporation's electric locomotive to Thornton Gate sidings. To celebrate the reopening of their refurbished ABC Theatre and Cinema complex on the 31st of May, 1963, ABC Television insisted on transporting their guests on the Western train, which they also sponsored. As a result, the wires had been retained as far as the Hippodrome feeder on Church Street. Working wrong line running and watched by large crowds, the train duly made the last ever trip over this section of the Martin route. As the empty vehicle shunted towards Talbot Square, the seven-month stay of execution was finally over. Within four days, the wires would be gone. There were to be no more surprises.
one veteran retained on site was number 59. Aimed at increasing revenue, starting in 1960, the Dreadnought had been hired out as an advertising car, at first to the Daily Mirror, all fares going to charity. In June 1963, the sponsor was the Milk Marketing Board. By now, the elderly standards were attracting worldwide attention. On the 15th of June 1963, 158 starred in yet another tour. With ever less track to cover, the former weed-covered mineral sidings at Thornton Gate, now the preserve of the Permanent Way Department since closure of Copps Road in January, became an obvious target. Until 1949, these had served as an active coal yard, the trucks being hauled by the electric locomotive along the tram road. More recently, they have become a graveyard for redundant standards and rail coaches. Later, they would be the final resting place for some coronations. Note the classic circular polo mint style tram stop on the nearby traction pole and the folded up platform step on the standard. The opportunity was also taken to visit Dixon Road and North Station, scheduled to close in just over four months. As the tram routes tumbled, so the bus strength increased accordingly. Amongst the diverse fleet were many examples of the distinctive, full-fronted, Burlingham-bodied Leylands, their centre entrances so favoured by Walter Luff mirroring those on the trams. This was one of a pair of Burlingham-bodied Leyland TS-8s converted for one-man operation in 1961. To increase availability and flexibility of the trailer sets, towing car 281 and trailer T1 were coupled together in 1963, the air hoses being repositioned. A somewhat cramped driver's cab was built at one end of the trailer, which allowed the unit to reverse on crossovers. The interior partition separating the cab with its unusually angled Z6 controller was only at waist height. Seating capacity was reduced to 61 but increased to 53 in the motor car by addition of a bench seat. The high capacity unit could now assist at times of peak demand on any part of the tramway. Eventually more units would be similarly converted. In the event of a coupling failure, improved breakaway connections allowed for disconnection of the power cables. The main running depot dating from 1935 was in Hopton Road. Since 1955, the tracks on the right, numbers 15 to 18, had functioned as an electrical fitting shop. As part of the ongoing retrenchment and rationalisation instigated by Franklin, the old rambling workshop complex dating from the early 20s was to be swept away to create a bus parking area as well as new tram and bus works facilities. The main entry point to the old works was from Blundell Street. The rows of different shops were reached by a traverser installed in 1922. Filmed during an enthusiast tour, 160 was one of some 40 cars built in the works up until 1929. Some of the buildings in the workshop area were former aircraft hangars, reassembled on site after the First World War. With Bispam Depot seen here scheduled to close to passenger cars in October, 
and as part of the overall reorganisation, the old 1885 conduit depot at Blundell Street, used by buses since 1956, had been reopened for trams in the March of 1963. A new rear entrance was built, and then later in July 1964, a four-track fan leading directly onto Rigby Road. The works car siding in the main depot adjacent to car 4, track 18, would remain without wires until May 1965. Built to fulfil the dual role of depot and exhibition hall, Hopton Road was gradually being modernised during the early 60s. By the end of 1963, it would become the main running shed. Work included installing new folding aluminium doors. The inspection pits, which had only extended halfway down the building, were gradually lengthened after the war. Another addition was the provision of this mobile washing plant. The destination display on these twin screens would fall into disuse when the station closed in late 1964. Seen some time earlier at Martin, Railcoach 222, when withdrawn, provided the trucks, underframe and equipment for the giant hover tram, latest addition to the illuminated fleet. This 48-foot-long 99-seater was the highest capacity car in Blackpool and the only purpose-built illuminated double-decker. It also had the distinction of being the last vehicle to be constructed in the old works. With a separate driver's cab and a single Z4 controller, it had a backup controller at the rear for reversing. Originally sponsored by Shell, who paid for part of the cost, it entered service in early September 1963, making on average two round trips per night. Inspired by the then state-of-the-art hovercraft, the hover tram sported glowing mock roof-mounted engines and over 4,000 bulbs. The closure of the one, the only route on the system to display a number, spelt the end of the through Fleetwood North Station link first established in 1898. Although only a mile of street track was going, local residents along the tram road were to lose their direct access to the business and commercial heart of Blackpool. Here, noted local historian and author Steve Palmer, then a conductor at Bispam Depot, walked back from the Bundy Clock at Fleetwood Ferry, ready for the seven-mile, 38-minute journey to North Station. With its interurban style name board, Ash Street was a turnback point for the first tram in the morning, plus several peak hour workings. This involved braving the traffic to swing the trolley. A one at speed on a classic stretch of the former tram road. The brush cars have been associated with the one since 1940, when they were housed at the reopened Bispam Depot. As from the 29th of September 1963, regular partway ones to Thornton Gate were discontinued. Reversing at Cleveleys. Since withdrawal of the pantographs, the one had been served by a mix of brush cars, Series 1 rail coaches, and the occasional double decker. In the summer of 1963, 13 cars had maintained the peak service on the one. Nine running through to Fleetwood every ten minutes, four shuttling to and from Cleveleys only every ten minutes, thereby offering a five-minute headway between North Station and Cleveleys. Approaching Bispam and the depot access track down Red Bank Road. This led to the former headquarters of the Tram Road Company. Right to the end, Bispam Depot exuded an air of independence with its own crew, inspectors, fitters, electricians and cleaners. All of these, despite being taken over by Blackpool, still worked, in spirit, for the other firm.
regaining the main tram road at Bispam Top. Throughout 1963, the Coronation shared the former tram road with Route 1. They were still responsible for the majority of duties on the through Stargate Fleetwood service. However, following closure of the one and increased availability of the more reliable rail coaches, from 1964 onwards the 19-ton coronations could be downgraded to summer use only. Although a useful stockpile of spares had been assembled from the scrap Martin van Backs, at the end of 1963, 313, scheduled for overhaul and repainting, was withdrawn to provide a further source of spares including a set of bogies. The long, drawn-out rundown of the class had started, but it would be another 12 years before the last of Luff's White Elephants was withdrawn. However, for the passengers, they were both comfortable and roomy, and they also had excellently positioned windows. Back with the one. At the gin, automatic points control movements onto the street running section. The abandonment was set to deprive local people of a vital alternative to the overcrowded promenade services. However, the police had finally realised their objective. For years they had agitated for removal of the trams in order that the junction in the background could be redesigned. After some prevarication, they had finally won. 299, one of the brush cars recently rebuilt with a single destination box, descended the steepest grade on the system at 1 in 26. This stop at the top of Worley Road served the town's Derby Baths. rumbling over the little used crossover at Eve Street. Formerly sited outside the Odeon, this had been relocated when the North Station terminal facilities were redesigned in 1961. Swinging round in view of the promenade in front of the Carlton Hotel at the start of the last quarter mile to the terminus. Approaching North Station. Most of the Series 1 rail coaches, like 217, would be withdrawn or stored following closure of the 1. Balloons had first appeared on Dixon Road in 1958 as market day specials to Fleetwood on Tuesdays and Fridays and to assist with holiday crowds to the station on Saturdays. In its newly modified livery, 250 nose towards the stub at North Station. Because of increasing traffic congestion in the narrowest part of Dixon Road, this had been recited to a point outside the Odeon as late as March 1961. To speed up turn rounds, a trolley reverser had also been provided. As the ones carried heavy PCAR traffic, there was a loading barrier and the inevitable Bundy clock to regulate departures. A long-lasting relic of company days was the provision of a parcel and newspaper delivery service between North Station, Bispam, Cleveleys and Fleetwood. This is Brush Car 298, currently being restored at Salford in 1998. On the final weekend, various tours were organised. Little Willie, the prototype luxury toast rack, 225, turned onto Red Bank Road for a visit to Bispam Depot.
On the same day, the 26th of October, the first of the former open-top balloons reversed at North Station. Note the distinctive non-standard livery carried by 237 at the time. In the morning, 160 had also put in an appearance, during which time it derailed at Thornton Gate sidings. Here, with its trolley between its legs, it was being sent back to Hopton Road in disgrace. On the last day, Dreadnought 59 made a rare trip up to North Station. Travelling along Dixon Road. The top deck offered an excellent vantage point from which to film the trolley reverser. For the third year running, the Blackpool season was to finish with an abandonment. On the last Sunday, the one was operated by about seven Bispam-based brush cars, assisted by a couple of double-deckers. The very last cars to traverse Dixon Road would be two balloons, carrying officials to cabin before returning south to Rigby Road. A little earlier, however, the last through number one to Fleetwood had departed at 10.53, operated by newly painted car 290. The driver was battling Bill Bracewell. And the conductor, Stanley Pollitt. Still showing one, the car waited at Fleetwood to travel the tram road back to Bispam Depot. On arrival, 290 effectively ended the last vestiges of the old tram road company. It was indeed an historic moment. The Blackpool system now faced its darkest period. Not only had the three town routes been replaced, but in order to save £400 per week, for the first time there would be no winter service south of Cleveleys. Linking with connecting buses, a clutch of single-deckers shuttled back and forth to Fleetwood, the trams running out from Rigby Road every morning. Naturally, Fleetwood objected vociferously at this radical marginalisation. On the credit side, the truncation did allow the Permanent Way Department to carry out unimpeded work. Seen at Stargate, overhead line cars 3 and 4 were both former standards. Note the replacing bus service 25 in the background. Working wrong line, here the pair ground their lonely way towards South Shore along the deserted and rusting promenade tracks. On Good Friday 1964, the through Fleetwood Stargate route was restored, operating every 12 minutes and supplemented by a new 12-minute Fleetwood Tower service aimed at partially compensating for the loss of Route 1. Apart from curtailments due to essential engineering work, the experiment has never been repeated. During 1964, relaying was taking place on the Metropole Street Track. This involved reversing on the Carlton crossover, now gone, prior to running forward. Inbound at the Metropole on the outbound track. Here the diesel-powered engineering car number three has been dispatched to rescue a balloon stranded on the tram road by a break in the overhead. The location, Westbourne Road, Russell Beach. The next few years remained decidedly uncertain for the trams, but by 1975 there was a degree of stability. 
including the illuminated fleet, 129 vehicles remained in 1964, housed in two depots, Blundell Street accommodating most of the seasonal extras. Despite the recent closures, costs were still escalating, one finger of blame being firmly pointed at the expensive coronations. Their steel frame windows had been replaced with plain glass and the roof panels sealed over, but problems were mounting with fractured axles, water ingress and corrosion. But it was the Vanback equipment, especially the accelerator housed at the base of the trolley tower, which caused constant trouble. It was susceptible to dust and sand, which caused short circuits, so blowing the contacts clean became a daily ritual. The brake blocks too needed frequent renewal due to the car skidding or braking violently on the greasy salt-laden rails along the length of the prom. Sometimes the electric braking would fail and the air brakes were insufficient to act as service brakes. Known as spivs by the traffic staff, for many of the work staff they were simply the horonations. With their four motors and rapid acceleration, they also consumed almost double the power of a rail coach. All this coincided with a belief that cost-effective one-man trams could help solve Blackpool's financial problems. In 1964, 310 emerged with fixed bus type seats for 64 and a new half-and-half -half livery, topped off with an orange trolley tower. Three Two Three's transformation was more radical. Conventional Z4 controllers from scrap rail coaches were installed to replace the costly Vanback equipment. Note the new ventilation grille in the dash panel. Eventually, 13 of the class were similarly re-equipped, releasing vital spares for the remaining Vanbacks. On the Z coronations, the drivers used the rear static braking notches on the controllers for the service brake. The cab floors were raised to give access to the controllers and as the drivers now sat higher up, the windscreens were also modified. As the conventional controllers could not operate the magnetic track brakes, these were removed. Capacity in Blundell Street was somewhat restricted as the building also doubled as an ambulance station. During its last full season, the 62-year-old Dreadnought was sponsored by the Daily Mirror during August 1964. Sporting its ABC TV adverts, the Western train made some daylight sorties during the summer of 1964, especially on the circular tour. Tower appeared on indicators following closure of Blackpool Central Station in the November. The remaining standards had all been on the road between July and October. Of these, 160 dating from 1927 was in the worst condition. On the 28th of February 1965, she made a morning tour of the tramway, including curves, loops and crossovers little used during the winter. Originally open balcony, these had been enclosed during the war. In the afternoon, the last standard gauge open top double decker in the world embarked upon a farewell tour prior to departing to the Tramway Museum at Kreitch in Derbyshire on March the 18th. However, within 10 years, the dreadnought would be back. In the drive for maximum flexibility, six more of the trailer towing cars were semi-permanently coupled to their trailers, each one of which was fitted with a new driver's cab. Like 281 and T1, these could now reverse on crossovers. Following a brief stint as a works car, 224 returned to passenger service in May 1965, with sister car 221 becoming an engineering car on the 21st of April. Eventually, both these Series 1 rail coaches would be rebuilt into one-man cars in the 1970s.
In 1965, the illuminated fleet was enhanced by arrival of the frigate, HMS Blackpool, the twelfth in a long line of decorated trams. Built by the work staff on the extended underframe of Pantograph 170, it was the longest vehicle in the fleet at 54 feet. Fitted with a Z4 controller at one end and an Allen West at the other, it had a pair of GEC 40 horsepower motors and a space to carry 70 passengers. Lit by 4,000 bulbs and displaying her sponsor's message, Get That Prudential Assurance, the frigate set out on her maiden voyage on the 3rd of September 1965. Later, she was to be rechristened HMS Prudential. The total of seats now available on board the illuminated fleet was 493. This included the two 78-seater standards. The highly popular tour of the illuminations provided much-needed additional revenue, as well as unrivaled vistas of the miles of lights and tableau. After lying in store, Hearst Nelson built standard 147 of 1924 was surprisingly returned to traffic in the autumn of 1965. Together with 160 seen here, these were the last cars to have swivel trolley heads. The sale of rail grinder number two left sister car number one of 1928 as the sole operational four-wheel tram on a mainstream British tramway. With B18 controllers, 235 horsepower motors, it rode on an ancient truck, formerly under a Martin boxcar. Coming up in a second, a glimpse of 264, which was rebuilt and lengthened after a collision into an experimental version of the twin-set cars. The final break with the old firm occurred on the 5th of January 1966 when Bispam, used as a store for two and a half years, was closed. Towed by Works Car 5, the last tram to leave was the semi-cannibalised Coronation 313, a type never operated from Bispam. 1966 marked the demise of the standards. First to go was 160, whose body was in poor shape. It made a final public outing on Easter Monday, April the 11th. The remaining trio soldiered on until the end of October, operating usually between Pleasure Beach and Bispam. By now these gaunt survivors seemed to represent a bygone age, when similar vehicles had once dominated so many Lancashire towns. They were also the last non-air brake cars in the fleet, drivers relying upon a combination of hand wheel and rear static braking. Since 1954, the ever-dwindling remnants of the original class of 55 had been retained solely for extra duties on the prom. On the 29th of October, they bowed out in style, with 147 and 159 carrying enthusiasts over most of the system. By this time, the preservation movement was gaining momentum, ensuring all but 160 were rescued from the scrap man. 147 seen here was to go to Columbia Park, Ohio, joining Emigre's 144 at the Seashore Trolley Museum and 48 at the Glenwood Trolley Park. The passing of the standards had been part of a policy instigated in the late 1950s, aimed at restoring the financial fortunes of the tramway. To date, the town routes had all been replaced, the works facilities reorganised, depots closed and over 50 surplus non-standard trams either scrap sold or converted into other uses. Attempts had also been made to standardise on equipment. However, all this had still not been enough. The department's finances remain precarious and to cap it all, passenger numbers had halved since 1961. Furthermore, the trams now only carried 25% of local traffic. It was only during the season that they came into their own. Staffing levels and restricted practices still had to be reduced. 
This coronation, for example, had two conductors, one under training. High-capacity, one-man cars were now a priority. During the winter of 1967-8, a few of the boats were scrapped, including 231 seen here. Always popular with the public, in retrospect this decision seemed somewhat premature. However, the boats did see very little actual use. At the first hint of rain, most crews tended to scurry back to Blundell Street, where the cars had been kept since 1964. In order to accommodate the department's new Honeywell computer, the trams were renumbered in May 1968. The remaining eight boats became 600 to 607. The 11 surviving English electric rail coaches, 610 to 620. By now, the distinctive metal fleet numbers above the centre doors had all gone. The 18 brush cars took the numbers 621 to 638. This one, formerly 289, retained its twin indicators, but the troublesome air-operated platform doors had been replaced by those from a scrapped rail coach. The coronations became 641 to 664. By the time of the renumbering, only 648, formerly 311, was in the old-style livery. The towing motor cars became 671 to 680, and the 10 trailers, then the newest passenger cars in the fleet, 681 to 690. The former open-top balloons were given the numbers 700 to 712. This one still had unmodified twin indicators. Whilst the 14 other balloons became 713 to 726. The rest of the fleet also received new numbers. For example, the overhead line car 3 became 753. By the late 60s, much of the rail on the 11-mile tramway was heavily worn. On the open reservation, it could be like riding on a switchback railway. Repairs were still in the hands of labour-intensive track gangs. On the reservations, bullhead rail was used. Life expectancy was 25 to 30 years on the straight, but sometimes as little as two years on certain curves. In the 70s, ribbon welding and more recently increased mechanisation have improved overall riding quality. The Permanent Way bus is one of only two survivors from 100 Burlingham-bodied Leylands delivered to Blackpool. Although the tramway has always exuded a certain timelessness, Evolution has been equally important. For example, the busy junction at Victoria Square Cleveleys was transformed when the old roundabout through which the trams had once passed was replaced by traffic lights. The 1970s were dominated by the demise of the coronations balanced by the introduction of cost-effective one-man cars. The end of each season meant further inroads into the ranks of the Vambach coronations, now confined to summer work only.
646 and 653, seen here in Fleetwood, turning from North Albert Street into Bowl Street, were among five coronations withdrawn in 1969. Several of the Z coronations, now back in all-year service and destined to remain for a few more years, were fitted with illuminated advertising panels. Although aesthetically displeasing, they provided much-needed revenue. The last three Vambach-equipped coronations were withdrawn at the end of the 1970 season, 641 making the final run on the 10th of October. As number 304, this had been the first ever coronation to arrive in Blackpool just over 17 years earlier on the 2nd of June 1953. Intended to be Manager Luff's crowning achievement, in reality the luxury cars had proved a financial disaster. These scenes show the cab of one of the Vambachs with the driver's joystick situated to the left of his seat and the forward reverser selector to the right. Additionally, the cars had air and handbrakes. In 1970, Franklin was reported as stating, the cost of spare parts was becoming astronomic. Once the loan charges were repaid, we started to get rid of them. After withdrawal, 641 was placed in store, pending preservation. The others were not so fortunate. Some were broken up by contractors, whose profits, however, were reduced by having to cut them into sections before carting them away. Seventeen years was a relatively short life for a tram, especially in Blackpool. At Thornton Gate, an in-service Z coronation seemed unaware of the dismembered skeletons of five of its sisters. By 1972 season, only five still remained operational, and even these were proving too costly to keep on the road. As a result, appearances tended to be ever more spasmodic. As part of a reassessment of fleet usage, double-deckers worked through to Fleetwood in July and August 1971, and then throughout the duration of the 1972 summer season. The balloons had first penetrated into Fleetwood in 1958, their high capacity proving a godsend, especially on market days and on Saturdays, when thousands of holidaymakers arrived and left the resort. The gradual rebuilding of the double-deckers produced many different variations, especially in the destination displays. Despite doing good business during the summer and the illuminations, serious financial problems still remained. Between 1955 and 1970, passenger numbers had plummeted from 42 million to just under 12 million, and the miles operated from 3.7 to 1.2 million. This decline, mirrored in other resorts throughout the British Isles, had been brought about by the advent of cheap package holidays abroad. There had been talk of replacing the promenade tramway by buses, and even possibly with a monorail, similar to that within the Pleasure Beach complex. However, wiser counsels prevailed, and despite a loss of £60,000 in 1969, the Transport Committee reaffirmed its faith in the tramway, stating that the line was a unique attraction and that it would be unthinkable to scrap the trams at this stage. However, they also issued a grim warning. If they were to enjoy a long-term future, drastic savings had to be made. The onus was now on management to implement major changes.
One objective was to reduce staffing levels by introducing one-man cars, especially during the winter season. Despite their imminent demise, driver training was still taking place on the Z coronations. Each balloon still had a crew of three. rounding the bend at Anchor's home crossing. In their drive towards one-man operation, the corporation had experimentally converted 638 in 1969 by cutting a door at the front behind the driver's cab. The experiment was a failure. Owing to objections from the union, 638 spent most of its time out of use in Rigby Road, and when it did venture out, it had a two-man crew. By 1973, it had reverted to a 48-seater two-man car. Note the cutaway bulkhead on the left-hand side. It was scrapped in 1980. The drive for one-man operation was given additional impetus in 1971 when the Ministry of Transport provided £250,000 towards the cost of converting certain cars, the design being entrusted to a subcommittee under the chairmanship of Alan Williams, the chief engineer. They were undoubtedly influenced by alterations made in 1968 to the English Electric Series 2 rail coach 618, when, in an attempt to provide an alternative to the coronations, its seating capacity had been increased to 56. This had been achieved by lengthening the body, the distinctive tapered ends being necessary for clearance purposes. More pronounced tapers would eventually become a feature of the one-man cars. Interestingly, 618, which had started life as rail coach 271, would undergo yet another transformation when it was rebuilt in 1976 as one-man car number 13. Here, it was reversing at Manchester Square, when the southern section of the tramway was closed for relaying. Unable to afford new bodies, the OMOs, the acronym for the double-ended one-man operated cars, were all rebuilt English electric rail coaches. The bogies and electrical equipment would be retained, and the original bodies, already 35 years old, kept up to the bulkheads, but given extended platforms and tapered ends, overall length being increased to 49 feet. As a result, trolley poles off scrap coronations would have to be used. Some people had argued that the body should have been cut and lengthened in the middle, but it had been imperative to get the OMOs on the road as quickly and cheaply as possible. When the first one emerged from the works in April 1972, it had cost just £11,000 to convert. To distinguish them from the rest of the fleet, the OMOs were painted in a striking livery of sunshine yellow and crimson, dubbed Plum and Custard, by the visiting transport inspector.
The first six even included two Series 1 rail coaches, 220, which had been laid up for several years, and works car number 5. Leaflets issued to the public prepared them to load at the front and then pay the driver, who in turn had to issue tickets and operate the controller with his right hand. Shelters were altered so that queues faced the trams, and the familiar round stop signs disappeared. One man operation on the winter schedule began in 1972. Due to corrosion, all the traditional solid cast iron shelters were also replaced in the 1970s. In the summer of 1973, the sturdy English electric rail coaches could be seen in no less than five different guises. This was one of the dwindling number looking in virtually original condition, but with fixed roofs. These were the cars converted to tow trailers in 1960. Then came the two oddities, plastic tram 611, the rail coach rebuilt following an accident. and 618, the tapered end rebuild with lengthened body. Finally, there were the Omos. The last unrebuilt rail coach in service, 615, was withdrawn for conversion in May 1975. By then, Joseph Franklin had been succeeded as general manager by Derek Hyde. During his tenure, Franklin had secured the future of the Promenade Tramway by first closing the town routes and secondly by introducing vital cost-saving measures. These scenes were taken when part of the Fleetwood Terminal Loop was being relayed. Unfortunately, riding quality on the Omos was poor. Much needed improvements were made in 1975, following replacement of the steel springs by rubber suspension. The first with this improved suspension was number 10, which entered service in a more visible red and cream livery. Still tending to rock up and down, it was nicknamed Pillars Bouncing Bessie, after the chief engineer of the day. Although the Omos were not popular with the public, who disliked the cramped aisles, the upright seats and the uncomfortable ride caused by the unsupported weight, they had probably saved the tramway. Through its policy of one-man operation on both buses and trams, Blackpool shed 170 conductor posts between 1969 and 1976. Heavy snowfalls are relatively rare on the file coast, here, frozen slush had to be cleared away by a track-clearing tool. On the more exposed reserve tracks, this impressive cavalcade of three linked balloons had been out acting as snow ploughs. Further modernisation included the fitting of single-arm pantographs in 1975, the first to car 678. Gradually, the bulk of the fleet would be converted, although the overhead could still be used by trolley-equipped cars. By the end of the 1975 season, the last coronations were withdrawn. The supply of special brake blocks had all but run out. There must have been a collective sigh of relief, as the last of the trams that had nearly ruined Blackpool, as the press dubbed them, were condemned. 663 was sold for preservation, but 660 was set aside by the corporation for use on special occasions. All-encompassing advertising liveries have become a feature of the tramway since the mid-70s. Although purists reacted with some disdain, for the cash-strap management it was a legitimate way of providing additional revenue. 707 was the first balloon to be so treated. 
622 trumpeted the delights of the zoo and splashland. In 1976, 634 sported this civic centenary commemorative livery. The following year, the theme would be the Queen's Silver Jubilee. To participate in another celebration, the American Bicentennial of 1976, one of the boats crossed the Atlantic, following in the footsteps of 601, which had sailed away to California for preservation in 1971. Hired from Blackpool for one silver dollar, suitably regaged, 603 spent the summer of 76 in Philadelphia, trundling sedately round a one-way loop of narrow streets, some of which passed close to many of the city's historic sites. After another summer, the popular little car left the city of brotherly love to return to Blackpool, arriving in July 1978. Then, after languishing unused and threatened with scrap, it again set sail for the new world, this time to San Francisco. 603 will be seen on the west coast of the States in Blackpool Trams Part 3. Having crossed the Atlantic no less than three times, this particular little boat must hold the record for the most travelled tram in the world. Another car to emigrate to the States was the Blackpool Bell. Constructed in 1959, 731 was withdrawn in 1978 when it was deemed uneconomic to replace her elderly wiring. By the end, the Bell had lost something of her original brilliance. Her final appearance would be on an enthusiast tour on the 14th of July 1979. Then in March 1982 she set sail for the Glenwood Trolley Park in Oregon where she joined standard number 48. This left just four units in the illuminated fleet. Seeking to create further one-man cars, two withdrawn double-deckers including 725 seen here underwent a radical transformation. Having gathered dust for seven years, 725 re-entered service in July 1979. Critics claim the balloon now resembled two back-to-back -back Atlantean buses. The original body had been rebuilt and extended to accommodate a single front entrance and exit. To complement its bus-style ends, 761 also had bus-type seats, and the traditional controller had been displaced by a simple joystick for acceleration and braking. Still on its original bogies, the new 98-seater rocked its way through the washer. Double-deckers from different epochs. The dreadnought, owned by the TMS, had been returned to Blackpool in 1975 and following a thorough renovation had been made available for use since July 1976. Here it was caught in a downpour at Pleasure Beach. Following union agreement, 761 or Phoenix first operated as a one-man car in February 1980. However, at times of peak loading, a conductor was still required. In 1982, 714, one of the balloons still with the 84 seating arrangement, was also rebuilt. This time, to speed up loading and unloading, the layout included a centre staircase and a separate entrance and exit. Riding quality was improved by designing completely new bogies, which were manufactured locally. The 90-seater 762 made its first appearance on the 31st of March 1982. Because of their crowd-swallowing potential, the two Jubilee-class double-deckers are known locally as vacuum cleaners by the staff. The corporation had embarked upon a programme of rebuilding its balloons in 1955, which was not finally completed until 1980 with car 709. This, together with 722, was the last of the class to have modified twin indicators. The only one of these solid old veterans to be scrapped was 705 after a collision at the Pleasure Beach in 1980. A delightful addition to the double-decker strength came in the shape of a reconstructed Bolton car of 1901. First entering service in July 1981, it rapidly became a firm favourite.
Initially, it was manned by volunteer crews and operated five days a week, but owing to fear of derailment, it did not originally venture out to Fleetwood. For many older visitors, 66 must have aroused long-forgotten memories of the sights and sounds of the once numerous bogey double-deckers which dominated so many Lancastrian towns. Twenty years had now elapsed since replacement of the town routes. The promenade tramway was in relatively healthy condition and confidence was returning to the undertaking. In the financial year 1982-3, the trams carried just over six million passengers, running up a deficit of £185,000, but this compared with 15.5 million passengers on the buses and a deficit of just over £1 million. Blackpool Transport received revenue support from both Lancashire County Council and Blackpool Borough Council. On the debit side, historic Blundell Street, built in 1885, failed to reach its centenary, being demolished in November 1982 following structural storm damage. The word centenary was to dominate the years 1983 to 1985. Blackpool, determined to commemorate 100 years of electric tramway operation in some style, had arranged for trams from all over the country to come and participate in the celebrations. The first of the foreigners to arrive was Edinburgh No. 35 in November 1983. On loan from Lothian Region Transport, the move south had been sponsored by National Savings in return for advertising rights. This was to set a pattern for most of the visiting trams. Built in 1948, the Edinburgh car was the first four-wheel tram to carry regular passengers in Blackpool since the demise of the Lytham system in 1937. On the 5th of April 1984, 35 was to be joined by another Scottish tram. This was Glasgow Cunarda 1297, also of 1948. On loan from the National Tramway Museum, to replace it, Blackpool sent Balloon 710 into Derbyshire for two years. On the 6th of April, 35 and 1297 participated in a great tram race in which the Edinburgh tram was the winner, the driver being presented with a haggis. As 35 wound its way through Fleetwood, the glistening streets revived poignant memories of trams in Leith and Granton. This was Cunarda 1297 seen later in the year. On April the 17th, 1984, Blackpool took delivery of its first new tram body in 30 years. Here it was seen leaving the East Lancashire Coach Builders Works in Blackburn, the same firm that had also supplied the corporation's 54 Atlantean bus bodies. Following its journey to the coast, the new body would be mounted on corporation-built bogies identical to those under 762, fitted with brush chopper control and refurbished English electric motors. Costing some £138,000, approximately half that of an imported new tram from Europe, 641 was to make her passenger debut on the 6th of July. Originally, ten cars had been envisaged. Their function? To displace most of the ageing OMOs, which between them had been responsible for approximately 50% of the total annual mileage of 800,000. However, owing to the costs involved, the order was eventually reduced. The year was to end with arrival of another four-wheeler, Sheffield 513 of 1950. The scene was now set for the great celebrations marking the centenary of the promenade tramway. Throughout 1985, thousands descended on Blackpool to share in the various special events. These together with developments up to and including the centenary celebrations marking the 100th anniversary of the Blackpool and Fleetwood Tram Road, will be covered in online tape Blackpool Trams Part 3, entitled Century to Century. Packed with superb footage, this tape is scheduled for publication in August 1998.